The Imaginary Emperor by Steve Bartholomew. Dear reader, please do not charge the orator of this yarn with historical inaccuracy, nor the author. He freely admits to it. This narrative is an appreciation, not a history. There really lived an Emperor Joshua Norton, who inspired, among other things, this story. We know the bare outlines of his biography, his dates of birth and death, his published proclamations, and so on. What we do not know are his innermost thoughts and feelings, what people he talked to, the sort of things he did in private when no one was looking, whether he was sane or mad. Did he really have a secret hoarded treasure? Perhaps. In fact, many articles in print about Norton are scurrilous and full of inaccuracies. For example, some folks still think that he owned those two valiant canines, Lazarus and Bummer. In reality, he hated the mangy curs. One could go on and on, but we won't. The author is interested not so much in the bare facts of the emperor's life as in his spirit. The author hopes the reader will find some fun in the reading of this tale. If one prefers facts or what passes for facts, please pick up an official history book. Part one, chapter one. The two men with their seconds meet at dawn. The sky, as usual, is overcast with a faint drizzle, which is not rain, but merely a heavier kind of fog. Out here at Lake Merced, just outside the city limits, the men can hear the distant booming of surf. Only a low hill separates them from the sea. The seconds of the two men meet and confer. Apologies are offered and refused. One of the two principals, the challenged, looks about with great care, knowing within himself it will be his final look at the world. His last name is Broderick. Oddly, both men have the same first name, David. Broderick never looks at his opponent, who had once been his friend. Broderick's mind is empty, thinking of nothing, least of all the long chain of events which has brought him here. He tries to fill his head with the sight of the lake, the trees, the sound of the surf that comes from over the hill. A coin is tossed. The challenger, whose last name is Terry, wins the toss. This gives him choice of weapons. Later, it will be whispered the coin toss was a cheat, but this is never proved. Terry brings forth a pair of Belgian .58 caliber dueling pistols. He has been practicing with these weapons all week. They both have hair triggers. Later, his second will claim he informed Broderick's second of this fact. He, in turn, will deny that. Now Terry gets choice of position. He stands with his back to the sun, which struggles to break through the mist. Broderick stands a measured distance away. One of the seconds begins a long count of three. One, two. Broderick raises his weapon. With his finger barely touching the trigger, it discharges into the ground. He drops his arm and stands still, waiting for Terry's shot. Terry is a marksman. He takes his time, aims, and fires. The bullet strikes Broderick in the side. He does not fall, but is led from the field. Only winged the bastard, Terry mutters. Three days later, Broderick is dead. The young, reported, the young reporter lifted his pencil from the notepad on which she had been scribbling. He was using a form of shorthand, which she had learned at school in St. Louis, and of which he was quite proud. He could also use a typewriter. He felt he was qualified for a better assignment than the one he was on now. But then, what could he do? Feature story, they called this. Maybe if he turned in something halfway interesting for the Sunday supplement, he might get a tryout on the crime desk, which was where he wanted to go. He said, but Judge Buxby, why did you tell me that story? 
I thought you were going to talk about the emperor. I understand you knew him well. Buxby lit up his pipe and stood to look out his window at San Francisco Bay. He puffed a smoke ring. Don't you get it? Gerald, you said your name was? That was September 16th, 1859. Exactly 30 years ago today. In two days from now, it will be the 30th anniversary of the Emperor's first royal proclamation. No doubt that's why your editor sent you all the way up here to get this story. It was the next day that Joshua Norton went down to the offices of the Evening Bulletin and handed in his edict proclaiming himself Emperor of California. His proclamation was published the next day. Most people think it was the loss of his fortune that drove Norton mad. That wasn't it at all. It was the duel that tipped him over the edge, the last duel ever fought in San Francisco. Come to that, I wonder if Norton was mad at all. Gerald cleared his throat. He'd have to, he'd have to be, wouldn't he? Anyway, wasn't it because he lost his money in the rice business? Oh, that. Buxby turned and resumed his seat in the leather armchair. He gave the reporter a look that made him feel he was about to laugh at him. I suppose that had something to do with it, he said. Everyone knows that tale. Norton was doing well for himself. He made a fortune speculating in real estate. He owned a rice mill. Then there was the famine in China that drove up the cost of rice. So Norton bought rice futures. He purchased the entire cargo of the Glide out of Peru before she even reached port. Then, when the ship finally arrived, several other shiploads of rice sailed in at the same time. The price plummeted. Norton went to court, trying to get out of the deal. He would have done better to take the loss, what with legal fees and court costs. In the end, he was bankrupt. But he was not a madman yet. He tried several other jobs, selling real estate and so on. No, it was the duel that pushed him over the edge. That and the woman. What woman? Gerald frowned. He never married. No, but that doesn't mean he was immune to the fair sex. Actually, there were two women. Buxby leaned over and pulled a photo album from the shelf. He flipped it open and held it so the reporter could see. Do you know who that is? No, sir, I don't. Well... You're not from around here, are you? You're from the South, I take it? She was quite notorious for a time. Her name before she married was Sarah Alethea Hill. She's in the madhouse these days, or so I'm told. Buxby flipped to another page. This one held the tin type of another woman. This is a singer, Marina. Surely you have heard of her. Gerald nodded. Of course. I've heard of her, sir. Who hasn't? But how does she figure in the story? Buxby turned the book around, as if to gaze into the woman's eyes. She was a protege of Lana Crabtree, who in turn was tutored by Lola Montez. Quite a line of descent. Norton had already decided to become insane by the time he met Marina, but both she and Sarah helped him along. The reporter began to feel he was getting in over his head. He had come up here to get a few personal anecdotes about the emperor. Instead, he sensed he was about to become entangled in a web of intrigue. Judge Buxby had poured him a sniffer of brandy, which he had not touched. On an impulse, he picked it up now and took a long swig. <clears throat> you see, Buxby said, it was like this. Joshua left the music hall around three in the afternoon. That new singer, Marina, was amazing. As good as Crabtree, maybe better. Joshua could not afford to buy a ticket, but he got in for free by working part-time as an usher. How the mighty have fallen, he said out loud, referring to himself. 
He wondered what he ought to do about his next meal. He'd been turned down in his bid for the job of city tax collector. Now that he was, not that he was surprised about that. These days, you had to know someone to get a job with the city. Strolling down DuPont Street, he came upon a large crowd of people on the sidewalk. They were nearly silent, waiting outside the office of the evening bulletin. There was something strange about this party, standing motionless, with only the sounds of low mutters and whispering. Joshua approached the nearest man, a well-off businessman or banker, judging by his coat and top hat. Joshua inquired what was going on. An outrage, the man said. Senator Broderick has been shot by Justice Terry. It said he will not live. Shot? Joshua had trouble taking in the word. But why? The man scowled. A duel, they call it. It wasn't a duel. It was an assassination. Surely you know Terry is one of those chivalrists, the pro-slavery party. They're no friend of working men like yourself. Broderick's an abolitionist. That's why Terry was out to get him. And I think they were once pals. Joshua wondered for a moment why this stranger had taken him for a working man. Then he glanced down at his own threadbare clothes and understood the reason. <clears throat> Will he get away with it, you think? Terry, I mean. The stranger shrugged. These days, anyone can get away with anything. Or think they can. Terry must think himself a king. He turned away. Joshua continued his long walk back to his rooming house. He was troubled. The world was not right. He had been an honest man all his life. He should not be bankrupt and poor. These violent quarrels should not occur in a civilized nation. Wicked men believed themselves kings. There should be a solution. There should be someone capable of setting things aright. A genuine, benevolent king. A moment arrived as he reached Commercial Street when the answer came to him. It was two days later that the youthful attorney entered the offices of the bulletin and asked to speak to the editor. It was his first experience of the inside of a newspaper office. He hoped it would be his last. The place was cacophony and chaos, with reporters and copyists shouting across the room at each other, the smell of ink and scraps of paper scattered all over the place. Someone came through the door from the back room, allowing entrance for the clatter and roar of the steam-powered press. The lawyer thought he might go mad working in a place like this. He was kept waiting ten minutes before the editor escorted him to his office. Though he closed the door, the din was barely muffled. The editor was round with a shiny scalp. He was smoking a cigar. He shook the lawyer's hand. Bannock's my name, and you would be, Buxby, the lawyer said, from the firm of Slater and Woodrow. I won't take up much of your time, Mr. Bannock. It was good of you to spare me a minute. I can see you're busy. He held up a copy of yesterday's bulletin. I came to inquire as to the meaning of this. Bannock glanced at the front page. There was a notice framed in black. The heading was, do we have an emperor among us? At the peremptory request of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the past nine years and ten months of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself emperor of these U.S. And in virtue of the authority thereby me vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the Union to assemble in the musical hall of this city on the first day of February next, then and there to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as, my, as may ameliorate 
the evils under which the country is laboring and thereby cause confidence to exist both at home and abroad in our stability and integrity. September 1859. Bannock handed back the paper. <clears throat> sort of a joke, he explained. Sort of a joke, he explained. Something to lighten the mood. The city is about to come to a boil over that duel. Most folks are outraged against the chivalrous and especially against Terry. Some are calling for a new vigilante committee. We thought this little item might give folks a chuckle, sort of cool off the steam, as it were. But how exactly did you come by this proclamation? Buxby asked. Did it really come from Joshua Norton? Bannock shrugged. That's who he said he was. <laughs> Came in late in the evening as I was about to go home. He handed me this paper. Very neatly lettered it was. He said he was the new emperor. And could we please publish the notice? I wasn't sure if he was serious or not. He didn't look like any madman I ever met. And I've met a few. Anyway, we need a filler for the next day's front page. So... In it went. As you can see, all the rest is about the duel. I see. Thank you, Mr. Bannock. You have been most helpful. You see, our firm represents some of Mr. Norton's creditors. We suspect he may have considerable funds squirreled away somewhere. This so-called proclamation could be a gesture on his part, preliminary to a plea of insanity to get out of paying his rightful debts. Bannock took the cigar from his mouth, scratched his chin under the beard. He looked thoughtful. You could be right. That there might make an interesting story for the paper. But maybe you ought to talk to Norton himself. Do you know where to find him? Buxby sighed. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid I do. Joshua turned slowly, regarding himself in his mirror examining the effect with a critical eye. Yes, he decided the peacock feather was a nice royal touch, not too ostentatious, but enough of a flair to seize attention. He had done well to cultivate a friendship with soldiers over at the Presidio. Now it was paying off. They had donated the uniform to his wardrobe. A beaver hat with cockade completed the royal outfit. Now he would not go out among his subjects unrecognized. Of course, he would have preferred to carry a saber, but since that was illegal, he supposed an umbrella would have to do. Finally satisfied with his appearance, he turned to the door of his room just as a knock sounded from the other side. He opened to confront a young, beardless man in a black suit. I'm sorry. Joshua said. I won't be holding court today. I was on my way out to conduct an inspection of the sidewalks. The man nodded, looking past Joshua's shoulder at the seedy room. <clears throat> ah, I see. Well, Mr. Norton, I wasn't planning to attend court. My name is Buxby. I'm an attorney. If you're on your way out, perhaps we might go along and have a chat. Is this where you hold court, then? Joshua stepped out and shut the door behind him. Please, address me properly, Mr. Buxby. You may call me Emperor. Yes, I'm afraid this is my temporary palace. I realize it's a bit modest, but it's only until I can negotiate improved quarters with one of the downtown hotels. What is it you wish to chat about? The two made their way out to Commercial Street, where Joshua turned in the direction of North Beach. Ah, well, Buxby had begun to wonder if this fellow might not turn out to be dangerous. The fact is, sir, I represent some of your creditors. <clears throat> I see. Well, of course, you must realize I am temporarily embarrassed but you may inform your clients I have every intention of paying whatever debts may remain. Of course, it may be necessary to impose a special tax, but I'm sure my loyal subjects will have no objection. Look there. 
Joshua suddenly stopped and bent over to point at some crumbling bricks at the curbstone. This sort of thing cannot be tolerated. I shall issue a proclamation. Buxby nodded. You're right, certainly. But then we have other problems besides sidewalks. You are correct. As emperor, I shall not shun my responsibilities, large or small. For example, we have this sort of thing. He stopped to point his umbrella across the street, where a small gathering clustered around a man standing on a soapbox in the middle of a sandlot. He was loudly orating to the small crowd, but only a few words were coherent, including Broderick, Terry, and Hanging. Ha! Joshua spat on the ground. Sandlot politics. That's how Brandon got started, the bastard. You don't care for Sam Brannon? Buxby asked. Brannon was one of the leading citizens of the city, one of its founders. <clears throat> you don't know him as I do. I was in the Committee of Vigilance, you see. It was Brannon that started and led the thing. I joined up because I wanted to see law and order, and we had not been getting much of that. But I quit when they started hanging fellows. They never should have done that without a trial. True enough, but then the city has put that sort of thing behind us. You know how Brandon got his start? Joshua seemed not to have heard. He came out here as advance guard for the Mormons, but then he decided to steal the Mormon money and set up business for himself. Most folks have forgotten about that. Oh, yes, but it was Brannon as started the gold rush, you know. Joshua's voice changed to a softer tone, as if he had begun to reminisce. His idea, so he could sell more stuff from his hardware store. He walked up and down the street, waving a gold nugget and yelling. A year later, there were thousands of immigrants, including myself. Buxby glanced at the other, growing more curious. I didn't know. You arrived here in 1849 then, 10 years ago, right at the start. I believe I mentioned that in my proclamation. See here, sir, are you hungry by any chance? Right up ahead is one of the finest lunch counters in this neighborhood. I recommend the soup. Buxby allowed as he was becoming peckish. The two men stopped and ate their soup slowly, standing up on the sidewalk. The food was passed over the counter to them from within. They both took time to view the passers-by, afoot and by wagon. Joshua seemed intent on eating, and Buxby had trouble thinking of more conversation. Drat, Joshua said. Those damn dogs. Two obviously flea-ridden curs had just strolled over from around the corner. Lazarus and Bummer, he said. Oh. For some reason, people seem to think they belong to me. Or maybe the dogs think so. I can't stand the mongrels. He tore off two pieces of bread and tossed one to each. The food disappeared in an instant. <clears throat> Noblesse obliged. Joshua told Buxby, one takes care of one's subjects, even those one despises. By the way, the lunch here is 15 cents. I'm sorry to trouble you, but yes, I, I know. You're momentarily embarrassed. Buxby tossed a coin to the counterman. Shall we walk on? In the next several days, Joshua began to realize both the burdens and privileges of being emperor. As he strolled down Market Street or in the commercial district, he noticed that people regarded him with respectful glances. Men sometimes tipped their hats, while ladies often smiled. He always bowed in return. Items about him began to appear in newspapers, he tried to keep up with the news as much as possible, though it was not easy. What with 12 daily papers to choose from, he found much of the news disturbing, especially on the national level. 
with the new stage run from St. Louis, it took only three weeks to get news from the East, where before it had taken two months. He wasn't sure this was a good thing. Now and then, restaurant owners would allow him a free meal if business was slack. One day, he passed one of the better downtown establishments and noticed a sign in the window. By appointment to His Majesty Emperor Norton. He smiled and reminded himself to return here on a weekly basis, at least till they tired of him. On this particular evening, he was on his way to the music hall to see if he might catch his way in. Marina was performing once again. He could not get enough of her voice. There was a short lineup outside the box office. Being magnanimous, he did not insist on going to the front, but took his place at the end. The crowd for this matinee appeared to be thin, he hoped Marina was not losing her audience. In a few minutes, he reached the ticket window and handed over a bill. One seat for the balcony, if you please. The ticket seller was a fellow of about 40, wearing a shirt with sleeve garters and no jacket. He had not shaved recently. He held the banknote up to the light, squinting at it. What do you call this? Not my fellow, Joshua wrote. Joshua replied, his legal tender in the amount of 50 cents issued personally by Joshua Norton, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, that person being myself. He gave a short bow. He heard someone approach behind him, but did not turn around. The fellow in the box looked at the bill again, then shoved it back. Nice printing job, but I'm afraid we can't accept this, your highness. Now see here, sir. Perhaps you would be good enough to provide your name? He gave the fellow an authoritative glare. Hmm. No, I would not. The other began, but the woman standing behind Joshua interrupted. What's all this? The ticket man with a sour face looked past Joshua's shoulder. A loony trying to get in for nothing, Miss Marina. Joshua spun about, nearly losing his balance. Then, collecting himself, he bowed. My lady, I had never dreamed to meet you in person. I have been your admirer and devotee for some time. I am... Yes, I know who you are, sir. I have heard about you. You would be the emperor. There was a drawing of you in the morning call. May I see that note you were using to buy a ticket? The ticket man passed it across. Marina studied it with care. Ah, uh, yes, 50 cents. That looks legitimate to me. Please give the gentleman a ticket, Hugo. And since the matinee is only 35 cents, you owe him some change. I shall keep this bill as a souvenir of our meeting. Perhaps we shall meet again, sir. She held out her gloved hand, which Joshua bowed over and kissed. Though the theater was half empty, her voice that day was superb. Chapter 2. The city seethed with turmoil just beneath its surface. There were fistfights, brawls, and near riots between abolitionists and pro-slavery factions, the chivalrists. Justice Terry, formerly of the state Supreme Court, having requested a change of venue, got his trial in Marin County for the murder of Broderick. He was acquitted, and the papers reported he'd left town for the South. Joshua read the papers, pondered, and discussed events with strangers he met on the streets. He also heard a lot of anti-Chinese talk in the streets. He wondered what he might do to bring about peace. The year of 1859 drew somehow to a close. Before it ended, Joshua heard of another horror. John Brown hanged in Virginia. He discussed the matter at some length with Bannock at the Bulletin before deciding to take action. This is wrong, Joshua said. Very wrong. <clears throat> How so? Bannock asked. Not that I disagree, but I'd like to hear your thinking, Emperor. It's wrong to hang a man who's obviously insane, 
should have been sent to a madhouse. I suppose so. But what makes you conclude he was mad? There's many another what thinks he was in his sound mind. He knew he was right. Only an insane man knows he is right. Those not crazy have doubts. Brown knew he was right until the very end. The fact that he was right has little to do with the matter. We should have compassion for those who never doubt themselves. <laughs> do you ever doubt yourself? Bannock asked. No, sir, I do not. Joshua turned to go, then stopped. I shall issue a proclamation tomorrow, he said. I am dismissing Governor Wise from his post in the province of Virginia. I shall name his successor in due course. There's someone you ought to meet, Bannock said. And who might that be, sir? A lady. Her name is Mary Ellen. She's head of the Underground Railroad in California. I shall look forward to meeting her, Joshua said. February came and went. None of the legislators he had summoned showed up at the music hall on the indicated date. Something would have to be done. Marina was off somewhere touring the country. He would have liked to hear her opinions. One of the people he did get to converse with was that lawyer Buxby, who had taken to dropping by Joshua's rooming house once or twice a month. I see you have had your portrait done, Buxby said, indicating the Deguero type on the mantelpiece. Ah, uh, yes, Joshua smiled. Rather flatters me, don't you think? I felt it proper that a person of my rank should have a state portrait. It cost me all of 25 cents. Buxby nodded in appreciation. Did you know that my firm had hired a Pinkerton man to follow you? No. A pink? What on earth for? Do they think me some sort of criminal? Joshua was astounded. No, sir. It's not that. It's more about what we have discussed before. You are aware that certain parties, among your creditors, that is, are persuaded that you may have hidden assets. Buxby sat down and picked up the cup of tea that the emperor had graciously provided. If I may be frank, there are some who believe your display of indigence may be a ruse to conceal hidden wealth, and that you are, in crude terms, a miser. Please do not take offense, sir. I only repeat what certain persons might say. Joshua gave a loud snort. <laughs> in indigence, you say? That's absurd. Am I not paying 50 cents a day rent here? Are not my needs being met? Of course, it is true your rightful sovereign should have more dignified surroundings, but I am hardly indigent. <clears throat> By the way, perhaps you would like to invest in another of my private bonds. 7% interest, guaranteed. I happen to have some fresh $1 bonds. Buxby sipped his tea, perhaps after payday. At any rate, I was going to say that your Pinkerton tale has been discontinued. It was determined that you are not spending profligate amounts of cash, nor could any clue to your concealed treasure be found. Still, I am in a quandary myself. I don't know what to make of you, sir. Joshua turned and stared out the window. Sometimes I don't either, he said. Having considered with care the problems afflicting the nation as well as the state, Emperor Norton resolved to issue a proclamation demanding the army arrest the Congress. He had already abolished that legislative body, but the damned curs continued to meet, ignoring his orders. Perhaps arresting these villains would stop some of the fistfights and wrangling in Washington. Having drawn up a first draft on fool's cap and made corrections, he carried it down to his friends at the evening bulletin. Bannock read it over twice, looking serious. This is indeed a grave matter, Emperor. It will appear in tomorrow's edition. I shall also post it on the board out in front. Are you sure this is the right thing to do? Joshua shrugged. I see no other course in these circumstances. 
I realize an even greater burden will fall upon my own shoulders. But these problems of preserving the Union and the issue of slavery must be resolved somehow. It's obvious Congress can't or won't deal with them. Bannock nodded. There's talk in the South of secession, of leaving the Union. So I've heard that would be a tragedy, but there may be no way to prevent it. Surely no one would be fool enough to go to war over it. I should hope not. By the way, there was a lady here inquiring after you. A lady, you say? Who might that be? And why would she come here to inquire? Bannock grew a thin smile. Sarah Althea Hill, her name is. She came here because she doesn't know where you live. I told her we are not free to divulge that information, but she left her card in case you should appear. He turned, went back to his office, and came back a minute later. He handed Joshua a nicely engraved pasteboard. She says you should feel free to call upon her. Thank you, sir. Any idea why? No, but she's quite beautiful, I must say. Joshua stared a moment at the calling card. It was unusual for a strange lady to leave a card for a gentleman. Usually it was the other way around. He pocketed the card and turned to go. By the way, Bannock said. Joshua halted and turned. Sir, perhaps I ought to let you know. I believe it is common knowledge. She is the mistress of Senator William Sharon. Ah, well, I'm sorry to have put the man out of his job. He tucked his umbrella under his arm and strode out the door. Sarah at first was puzzled when her maid announced a man at the door of her apartment waiting to see her. It had been more than a week since her visit to the bulletin. She had completely forgotten her invitation. She had been terribly busy with arrangements for Senator Sharon's next trip to the city this coming weekend. This occasion was to include a formal soiree in the hotel dining room. Her maid handed her a calling card engraved, H.R.H. Joshua Norton, Emperor of U.S. and Protector of Mexico. Then she remembered. Please show the gentleman to the parlor, she said. It will only be a moment. The maid turned to go, but Sarah called her back. Tell me, how does he seem? I mean to say, does he seem at all crazy? The maid shrugged. He's oddly dressed, ma'am, but well-spoken for that. Sarah nodded and made a shoe gesture. The maid turned and left. Sarah inspected her image in the mirror. She supposed she looked well enough to charm an emperor. She was aware of how to use her beauty. Still, she had doubts about this Norton person. It wouldn't do to take chances. She found her handbag on the dressing table, popped it open, and inspected the small pistol within. It was one of Mr. Remington's latest designs, and she had more faith in it than in most of the men she knew. She tucked the bag under her arm and went out to greet the emperor. Joshua cut quite a figure, standing at attention in the parlor, beaver hat and cane under his left arm. He made a sweeping bow. <clears throat> I am here to answer your summons, my lady. And I am honored in turn, she said. She invited the emperor to sit and ordered her maid to bring some tea. I'm told you arrived here during the gold rush, she said, when they had both become comfortable. <clears throat> Indeed, Joshua responded. Of course, that's all in the past, madam. The rush is over. The city has become in a different sort of place. But there are still fortunes to be made. The city has a great future. I only hope I may help it along. Yes, I understand you yourself amassed a considerable wow. fortune at one time. True enough. It was simply a matter of wise investing. Personally, I never had to go up to the hills to dig for ore, though I wager that might be quite an adventure. But these days, I am not much concerned with finances or commerce. I wish to be 
An enlightened ruler. Certainly. The country is in need of one. But please permit me to inquire, if I'm not being too personal, as to how you manage to finance your government through taxation, or do you rely on your own personal savings? Here, Sarah was fishing for the information that she was really after. She had a feeling, backed up by common rumor, that the emperor might have concealed assets which it might be worth one's while to know about, and perhaps to acquire. She gave Norton a sweet smile, waiting for an answer. Joshua patted his own coat pockets, searching for something. Having found it, he produced a thin sheaf of engraved documents. As a matter of fact, madam, I'm happy you have asked this question. In reality, there is considerable expense in managing my government, although the expense is much less than it would be to support a Congress and president. However, I've not found it necessary to impose new taxes. Instead, I can offer you a profitable investment. I happen to have with me some of my personal bonds, which pay a guaranteed income of 7% upon maturity. Joshua went on at some length, explaining the purpose of his bonds. Somehow, Sarah found herself holding several in her hands. She found them artistically designed. Finally, she waved a hand to stop his, his spiel. I'll take $10 worth, she said. Joshua looked pleased, though serious. Sarah passed him a $10 coin, which he quickly pocketed. After that, she got rid of him as quickly as possible, though politely. When he had departed, she went to her dressing table and got out her journal. She dipped a pen in ink thought for a few moments, then wrote. Emperor Norton is an enigma. He seems quite rational, not at all mad, except about his own station in life. He will bear watching. I shall endeavor to obtain his confidence. It's quite possible he may have a fortune hidden somewhere. I wonder if his bonds actually will be worth anything. I must get busy for that soiree this weekend. I'm sure I can soon talk William into marriage. Joshua, leaving the hotel, felt prosperous with ten dollars in his pocket. He reflected that wealth is a matter of viewpoint. A pauper may feel rich with a few dollars, while a millionaire may feel he is ruined if half his fortune disappears. He decided to indulge himself with lunch in Chinatown. Most white people he knew wouldn't go there because they considered it dirty and dangerous, but its residents were, after all, his subjects. They usually made him feel welcome, though his laundryman refused him credit. At any rate, it was time for another inspection. He crossed Barkett Street, observing the pavement and watching the horse cars. He continued his stroll for several blocks north till he reached the edge of the Chinese district. He nodded and tipped his hat to a small group of older gentlemen dressed in black. Some of them smiled back. Others merely looked at him without expression. He walked further on, growing hungry. He had hoped Miss Hill might offer lunch, but held no resentment. Since she'd been good enough to purchase his bonds, he wondered which place he should choose for his meal. There were plenty of lunch counters and restaurants to select from, as well as pushcart vendors. Finally, he settled on a place that looked clean and busy, always a good sign. He went in and took his seat at a table. There were a lot of Orientals in the place, as well as a couple of sailors nearby, speaking Russian. A waiter approached and handed him a card printed with characters. Joshua smiled. I'm afraid I can't read. My friend, you speak English, do you? The waiter shrugged. Sure, what you want. <clears throat> what would you recommend? The waiter, unsmiling, said something in Cantonese. <laughs> Fine, I'll have that, Joshua said. While waiting for his meal, Joshua observed everything around him. After all, this was part of his job as emperor, being aware of what went on in his kingdom. As he was watching the crowd in the street, a white man walked by. 
The man glanced in the restaurant, started to walk on, then looked back and stopped. He came in and went to Joshua's table. It was Bannock, the newspaper man. <clears throat> Hemper, he said, you turn up in the stranger's places. Mind if I sit down? Not at all, sir. Would you care for some lunch or perhaps tea? My treat today. <laughs> perhaps a little tea. I wouldn't dare eat food in this place. He paused as the waiter served Joshua with a large bowl of noodle, vegetables, and some kind of fish. Joshua had, <clears throat> Joshua had, through necessity, learned the art of eating with chopsticks. Chinatown was the most economical place to purchase a meal, but they were short on forks or spoons. He began devouring his lunch. And what? He said between mouthfuls, if I may ask, brings you to this neighborhood, Mr. Bannock. Bannock poured himself a cup of tea. <laughs> News, of course. I can't trust any of my reporters to dig up the real stuff. They're all greenhorns. They work for me till they can find better jobs. There's rumors about a tong war. I came down here to do some snooping, also to see my doctor. Your doctor, sir? You are ill? Nothing too serious, just a touch of lumbago. I won't go near those uptown medicos. Most of them can't tell one body cavity from another. But there's a Chinese doc down here who's done me some good. Dr. Luck by name. A lucky sounding name. Perhaps I might consult this gentleman myself. Does he charge much? That was how Joshua Norton came to know Dr. Luck. Weak lung, chi, weak lung chi, the doctor said. Joshua lay on a table with his coat off. They were on the second floor of the building. Dr. Luck had been examining Joshua for more than half an hour. He had taken his pulse on both wrists, examined his ears, thumped his chest, and peered at his tongue. He was not like any other doctor Joshua had met. Joshua sat up and adjusted his suspenders. I don't have any breathing problems, doctor. It's just I have some trouble sleeping. Perhaps some laudanum. Dr. Lush, Dr. Luck brushed off the sleeve of his own coat jacket. He spoke with a cultured English accent, as if he'd spent some time in London. No laudanum. I shall prepare a medicine for you. You have a very weak lung chi with excess yin. The <clears throat> the lungs are the seat of the emotion of sadness. This is why you are unable to sleep. You have too much sadness. Joshua was startled. He never thought of his own sadness, much less talked about it. But he could not deny it. There are reasons to be unhappy these days. Dr. Luck had turned around and was mixing herbs from several different jars. He said, you are sad first and find reasons. It is not the reasons that make you sad. You take this medicine home, boil it in a crockery pot for 10 minutes, no more, then you drink. Thank you, doctor. How much do I owe you? One dollar. You come back in a week. Maybe we do some acupuncture. What's that? Oh, never mind. I suppose I'll find out. He put on his coat. Dr. Luck, as you may be aware, I am emperor of the United States. Did you know that? The doctor merely shrugged without expression. He seemed to be waiting for Joshua to leave. As such, I am responsible for the well-being of my subjects, including the residents of Chinatown. I was wondering if you might tell me something of conditions here. How goes it for the people? Are they prosperous and peace-loving? Dr. Luck stared at him for a moment. We are well enough, he said, if left alone to do our work, but we are not always left alone. Ah, well, doctor, I thank you again. I can see you have patience waiting. Perhaps we may converse again? Perhaps. He saw the doctor again a week later. He tried to pay with one of his own imperial dollar bills, but this Dr. Luck refused. 
Joshua gave him some of his hard-won silver instead. This time, the doctor did not seem quite as rushed. He had inserted some tiny needles into Joshua's back and answered a few questions while his patient lay there. In fact, they had a rather lengthy discussion, comparatively speaking. Joshua began to understand matters he had not thought of before. In what way did you become emperor? Dr. Luck asked him without warning. Joshua turned his head to watch him mixing herbs. Do you mean when? No, I suppose that's not what you meant. Perhaps you mean by what authority? He closed his eyes. He was feeling relaxed and peaceful. In fact, better than he'd felt in weeks. He had never considered this question, nor had anyone asked it of him. The doctor continued mixing herbs, perhaps awaiting an answer, perhaps not. It was the duel, Joshua answered at last. You remember when Terry killed Broderick? I asked myself how a man could get away with such a crime. And him a prominent citizen, no street thug. Back in the days of the vigilantes, we used to hang murderers, gangsters like the Sydney Ducks. Terry was against the Vigilance Committee. He stood for law and order, but he stabbed a man with his bowie knife. He got away with it. You see, doctor, if a man says he's a judge and claims authority, he may do anything he wishes. If he says he is right, then he is right, because people believe it so. I claim the right to be emperor and to use my powers for good, not evil. I'm emperor because I believe it as do the people, my subjects. He fell silent. Dr. Luck turned to him and began removing the needles. He had no comment. The next day, Joshua heard that Marina was back in the city. He was running short on cash and had doubts that one of his personal banknotes would work a second time, so he strolled down to the music hall and waited by the stage door and back, hoping to catch a glimpse of her as she made her exit. On his way, he had gathered a bunch of poppies from a vacant lot for a bouquet. This was not one of her personal concerts. She was appearing on stage in a variety show, which included a string quartet and a recitation of Shakespeare. Joshua took a seat on an empty pickle barrel in the alleyway. Through an open window, he could just make out the muffled orations of Shakespeare. He smiled, remembering another Shakespearean event he had once witnessed in this very hall. He was still sitting there an hour later when Marina came out the door. He had been privileged to hear her sing an aria from Cosi Fantuti. His heart all but broke, listening. Ah, my emperor, she said as she appeared outside. He leapt to his feet, startled, not having expected her so soon. What delightful flowers for me. Perhaps you could do me the honor of escorting me to my hotel, she said. I'm afraid I can't afford a cab today, but it's only a few blocks. I should enjoy the stroll. He bowed, sweeping his hat and peacock feather. An honor, madam, but I thought you would have stayed for the final curtain call. She made a dismissive gesture with her fan. I shouldn't bother, not with what they're paying me. Perhaps I should have accepted that offer to tour in Europe. But matters are so unstable these days. I thought California might be safer. But how have you fed, Your Majesty? Did you hear me sing today? He smiled. Indeed, you were heavenly. I also caught some of the Shakespeare, which reminded me of an incident several years ago. There was a company performing scenes from Shakespeare. The audience was made up largely of families with children. He paused to point upward toward Telegraph Hill. As you know, that semaphore is used to communicate with ships entering and leaving the bay, as well as to let the harbor master know what ships are arriving. Of course, all the young boys in town have learned to understand the signals. Well, during this theatrical performance of which I speak, an actor rushed on the stage, spreading his arms wide, like this. Joshua stopped to dem demonstrate. Whereupon he declaimed, What meaneth this, my lord? Immediately, a red-headed Irish man shouted, 
side wheel steamer. Marina stared at him a moment, then burst into laughter until tears came to her eyes. When she was able to speak again, she said, Emperor Norton, you have made me laugh for the first time in weeks. How can I repay you? He bowed. Madam, hearing your gaiety is reward enough. Mm, nevertheless, you shall dine with me this evening, and I don't care what the public will think. Marina felt generous and in a spending mood. She took him that evening to a high-toned restaurant located in the Montgomery block, the place most local called locals called the monkey block. <clears throat> What's money for if not to spend? <laughs> she laughed. You made me smile. You deserve a reward. Joshua had no objection to luxury. She ordered champagne while they studied the menus. She said, I recommend abalone. He ordered that as well as a poached sole. Marina asked for lamb chops. He said, I take it you have been unhappy of late. Who wouldn't it be? She said, do you read the papers? There's a good chance Mr. Lincoln and the Republicans will be elected. Surely you know what has happened in Kansas. I was torn in the South, New Orleans and Atlanta, among other places, but I decided to cut it short. There's so much anger there. They don't look kindly on Yankees these days. Joshua drew lines on the tablecloth with his finger. He said, Would that I could help. The Congress persists in holding their meetings despite my orders. <clears throat> and the army also ignores my proclamations. I could issue a proclamation freeing the slaves, but I fear it would be ignored as well. Marina leaned across the table, gazing directly into his eyes. She spoke in a lower tone. Emperor, I wonder, might I ask a question without your taking offense? For surely, you know I do not mean to offend. He lifted a silver spoon to sip delicately at his soup. Please ask, dear lady. She glanced about the room, as if to make sure no one overheard. The restaurant was not crowded, but it was becoming busy. She spoke in a low tone. I know you do read the newspapers, Emperor. Surely you have seen the articles they write about you and the cartoons. Do you know they're making fun of you, laughing at you? Do they? He continued, sipping at his soup. She shrugged. Well, yeah, but I see that doesn't bother you. Perhaps those jackals of the press are simply too far beneath you for notice. If that be the case, you have my support. Thank you, my dear. Emperor, she continued in the same tone. They say you're crazy. Do you think that's true? He looked up at her. Quite possibly, he smiled. <clears throat> who's, he who's that headed this way? Glancing past his shoulder. Oh, yeah, I know her. Joshua turned as the other lady approached, then pushed back his chair to stand. <clears throat> Please don't rise, Sarah said. I just came by to say hello. If I'm not mistaken, this is the famous Marina. We met two seasons ago when you were in Don Giovanni. How charming to find you both together. Two of San Francisco's most famous citizens. Do you come here often? Rarely, I'm afraid, Marina said. I've been on tour, only just returned, but I do hope to remain a while. I hope you will accept an invitation to my next soiree. Perhaps you could both come, but you must excuse me. I see my escort is becoming impatient over there. I only dropped by to say hello. Enjoy your evening. Marina watched her retreating back. There's something about that woman that grates on me. <clears throat> I found her agreeable, he said. She bought some of my bonds. From the Journal of Sarah Althea Hill. Now I am convinced. The matter is settled. This evening I discovered Emperor Norton dining formally at the Monkey Block in the company of a local theater woman, a diva named Marina. I'm sure she doesn't come cheap. 
If Norton can afford to wine and dine celebrities in such an establishment, then he is no pauper. He must have a concealed treasure somewhere. I think I shall get to know this gentleman better. Perhaps I shall speak to that trollop as well. 